put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Alan Wake Video Game Review Alan Wake is a writer of true crime novels and he has been... Excellent. Just crime novels, I think. He has... He's in a bit of a... He's experiencing writer's block. And he and his wife Alice are vacationing in Bright Falls, a small harbor town in Washington. And early on something goes wrong and Alice disappears under strange circumstances and Alan now has to try to get her back all the while fighting these strange phenomena including possessed people from the town. Now this, I should start by saying this is based on the PC version and I know very little about the original Xbox 360 version so I won't be making any comparisons. Now this is this is a very fairly interesting game in a couple of different ways. For one thing it has this episodic nature where basically the game is divided into these six episodes each with their own focus of, and all adding to the whole and it's basically the the approach of a television show and it really helps tighten up the pacing where a lot of games can feel like they meander at points this one yeah very much keeps it tight and it also helps make even a short you know, even if you're not playing for very long, it feels gratifying. You really, you can tell you made progress. It does, however, also mean that the the length is a bit underwhelming. The six episodes range from 75 to 115 minutes each. And I personally completed it in nine and a half hours. Now the two DLC are even shorter with basically two hours total. In fact, the PC version, at least the one I got on Steam, came with the DLC. I understand that the original Xbox 360 version does you have to buy them separately. I wouldn't necessarily spend money on the DLC unless they're really, really cheap. It's... they're supposed to kind of be... like the, the six episodes are the first season of Alan Wake's story and while Alan Wake's American Nightmare is not the intended second season, Remedy would like to return to the story of Alan Wake and make a second season. The two DLC chapters are supposed to be bridging the gap between the six episodes and the intended second season. I can see what they mean by that, but you don't need to play the DLC. It, the ending of the six episodes... Uh, are probably the weakest part of the game, especially like writing and story-wise, and the DLC do not really 
get you much further. Now, the... So, yes, the, the ending is indeed the... the um, among the weakest. It, it is pretty underwhelming. You, you can, in part, guess it and see it coming. And it also just... Yeah, it, it has... It, it, it gets both the good and the bad of the, the television show. I, I find that often when you spent so long building on something, like with a TV show, I find that show endings are more likely to disappoint than movie endings because of all this time spent and because it wasn't made all at once. When there's a movie, you you can kind of write the ending and then backtrack, then find out how do we get there. With a TV show, you cannot be certain what you're left with, how many seasons you get, what actors are still on by then, you know, what, what happens along the way. This one was, of course, made all at once, but it still does have that, you know, after all that time building something up, they just, they can't completely deliver a satisfying ending to that. But along with the pacing being very tight, the story is also very tight. It, it kind of has a, yeah, the, the focus is sharp throughout, and while there are there's, there's at least one part of the game that I do wish was tightened up a bit. Other than that, the story does keep moving very nicely throughout. And it, yeah, it keeps you going. They're, they're, you know, they have cliffhangers and twists along the way. You know, a, cl a cliffhanger at the end of each episode to get you coming back. And it very much has what a television show has with this thing of you want to see the next episode, you want to see where they go with this and that's very effective. It is of course compared to your average show, unless I guess it's a cable show, it's fairly short of a season and there's good and bad to that. I think it's risky to, again, when an episode can be almost two hours, that's three times what a, you know, what your average episode of a television series can be, so, but, but, yeah, with nine and a half hours total, it still isn't the same as watching a full season of a television show, but at the same time, watching is more of a passive thing and not everyone is going to want to play through, you know, what amounts to 22-ish episodes of 42-ish minutes each. Now, the... the an, another thing that's very interesting about this is the focus on light and dark. Now, this is, of course, an element in pretty much every horror story. However, and, and many horror games as well. Now, this takes a more direct approach. Very... Throughout, the, the focus is that, you know, darkness is bad and light is good. And an early example of that is that Alice has this fear of the dark, like a, a, a straight-up phobia. It terrifies her, and every enemy, the enemy, the enemies only come out when it's dark, and they kind of just appear out of the shadow and disappear back into the shadow when you reach what is called a safe haven, which is a static light source such as a you know a street lamp where you can just go in under and. These are checkpoint saves, although not all checkpoint saves are safe havens, and the light literally does prevent the enemies from coming in, and, and 
like I just said, the safe haven literally makes the, once you're under that street lamp, the enemies disappear back into darkness. And it's a very effective, I've never really seen that done in a game. This game does several things that you don't really see in other games. I, I haven't really seen another game where they straight up have enemies disappear when the, the protagonist reaches what is perceived to be a safe area. It's very common in horror movies, however, and I, I really love that they put it in here because it is this sort of thing of the darkness is always dangerous. The fact that the enemies are gone now while you're in the safe haven doesn't mean that you're now perpetually safe. You're gonna leave that safe haven immediately. You, you can't uproot this you know, street lamp and walk around with it. So the moment you get back into darkness, they could come back and attack you. It's, it's very effective like that. In a safe haven, your health regeneration is sped up significantly. And yes, you, you do heal whenever you aren't taking damage. And this, I find that this was a good approach. You're not running around looking for health items and you can't heal in the middle of a fight. You have to defeat the enemies in order to, or, or at the very least, keep them at bay for long enough for you to get back health. And the light is also a... Basically, you're, you're, it's, it's a necessary part of your arsenal. You have a flashlight on you at all times, and then a, a few guns. And basically the flashlight removes the shadow, or the dark presence, I suppose you could call it, from the so-called Taken, which are these possessed townsfolk. And the only way to kill a Taken is to remove this possession. And this means that literally, no matter how many bullets you fire into one, they won't die until you've applied light to them. And part of this is your flashlight, but I've already mentioned safe havens. The safe havens literally make them disappear, but then there are static light sources that aren't safe havens. That, you know, if, if you can't be, like, covered by the light, then it's not enough for it to be a safe haven. And there are a ton of generators around that you, you know, you can start or a little, like, you know, 500 watt, you know, work lights like you use, you know, for you know, painting, construction artworks, and you know, stuff like that, where you need really strong light and yeah these are just standing around the, the these 500 watt lights you can just flick on but these generators you will have to start it's it's one of these you know you pull up the thing a couple of times to get it going and this is a great concept because you can literally be running away from the taken and you reach a generator, and you know that this is your best shot to, and or I guess you you're forced to make this choice: Do I turn around and face the Taken, or do I take advantage of this generator? Do I go in for this? You know, it'll take a couple of seconds, and you will have to just be extremely cool-headed to actually focus on. If if you're attacked, you can't keep you know, starting the engine, so you have to judge, do I have enough time, and go in there, and you can't just, you know, you, you have to, it's, it's a mini game, I should say, you have to press the left mouse button when he is to pull, when, when Alan is to pull up 
the, the thing. I'm sorry, I don't know what it's called. I'm not a I'm not a very physical guy. I it it if if you press it any other time, you will have to start over getting the engine going. So you have to be extremely cool headed to tap it at the right time and to decide do I leave myself open and you know will I be able to get this started or am I going to you know turn around and face them and, and fight them off now to return to the flashlight there are a couple of different strengths of flashlight and the basic idea is as long as you've got the flashlight pointed at an enemy directly at an enemy and and this is basically you know it it goes wherever you point when whenever you turn Alan the the flashlight will be pointed directly at this is kind of the new way to do this sort of horror you know in in like you know Silent Hill for example the, the earlier Silent Hill games especially the you know you'll have this the, the light in in your chest pocket so whenever you turn the character it is basically lighting but this is whenever you aim is the 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 flashlight beam is your reticle it's your targeting thing it's it's your crosshairs and if you are just pointing it without you know if if you focus aim you focus the flashlight beam and that will drain the batteries much faster or actually I'm, I'm not sure the batteries drain at all if you're not focus aiming if you aren't focus aiming you can still be you know taking away the, the shadow from the taken but it takes much longer and you aren't focus aiming so it's yeah it's it's riskier you don't know necessarily if you're gonna hit it's Focus aiming, I'm sure you know what that is. And this is a great way to to give some some you know to disempower the, the player, which is always a good thing to do in a horror game. The you, you will literally have to manually de shadow every single enemy. And you can do this one by one, or you can use other th things like, like I said, the, these more static lights will, of course, they, they will light up a, a larger area. And, of course, these can't remain on forever, so you might have to turn it on and then quickly get the taken into the, the, the light. Or it might run out before the you know, before you're done. And that's, again, a great thing. That's also, you have to manually load the batteries into the flashlight. And it might take more than one battery to fill up the flashlight, especially the heavier duty flashlights. And this doesn't take very long, but it is another thing you have to worry about reloading. And it literally can mean the difference between life and death if you load it at the right time, if you load it before it runs out completely, or if, and, and if you, it, it'll also recharge man, by, by itself, but that takes longer, and certainly you can't be both recharging the battery and focusing the flashlight, so there's a number of choices there the player has to make, and anytime you've got your flashlight focused on one enemy, because that's all you can hit with the flashlight at a time, you have to be careful that another enemy won't circle around you and attack from behind. So that's very effective. And something I really like also is that, as I said, you, you won't kill them with gunfire before the shadow is gone, but you can't slow them down. If you use like a shotgun, you can force them back, which is really fortunate because some of the tougher taken literally can just push through your you know your flashlight. I mean you'll be draining their shadow, but if you just stand still and focus the flashlight beam on them, 
and you're not shooting them with a shotgun, they will just keep going and the shadow won't be gone by the time they get to you and start attacking you. Now, the other things that you can use to get rid of shadows are flares, and basically, if you hold down the throw button, you will be carrying it. And you can't run while you're carrying a flare, so that, there's that risk as well. But you can be moving further towards the, the Taken. And as long as the flare is lit, it's a bit of a... You know, it, it has more... Not range, but it goes in a circle around you. So if you're, if you're surrounded, maybe break out a flare, and li like I, you know, the, the Taken, other than the stronger ones, will be repelled by the light. They won't be killed by it, but they will, you know, be forced back as long as you have a light source, you know, towards them, shown towards them. And then you have flashbangs, which, yeah, they, they really thought about what would be good to use. And the flashbangs literally work like a sort of grenade, except they can't hurt you. So you just you throw it out briefly in front. Oh, actually, to finish off the flares, you can keep it in your hand, but if you just tap the, you know, the key for flares or flashbangs, you'll just drop it at the ground. And this is a great way to buy yourself time to put more batteries in the flashlight, reload your gun. When you reload, you can also tap the reload key to speed up reloading, which I hope gets put in every single survival horror game that has you using guns. Because it's such a great way to it, it gives you something to do to to help with the with the with the reloading. So you're not just sitting there frustrated, yelling at the the game for not speeding it up. And it's you know, it, it ratchets up the tension. Because, you know, again you have this you know, and, and again, you don't have to be doing that. You can just press reload and let Alan do it at his own pace. Now, the, the, the flashbangs, once you've thrown in, you know, basically everyone in a small circle around you will die just like that. It's, it's that bright of a flash, you know, then they can die by just light. And it's the same thing with the flare gun, which is basically like a flashbang, except it has more range, you know, it'll keep flying out. You, you can use this several meters range. Or you can fire it very close to you. And of course, it's a flare gun, has to be reloaded for every single round. So with all these, you, you have to use them wisely. It's, it's a balance between the different ones. And of course, you won't... At, at all times have equally much of the, the different ones and you have fairly limited carry capacity so you need to familiarize yourself with all the different weapons and get good at strategy and I find that it it staves off monotony for the gameplay I know some people didn't feel that way but I think it's also Basically, if you're not into the story, if you know, if you start playing this game and the story isn't gripping you, then you should probably just stop playing. It it really isn't for you. The gameplay, you know, it's it's like with Left 4 Dead. You don't have to play it for very long before you've tried everything that the game that the basic, you know, tools of the game have to offer. Now, the game will throw curveballs at you, it'll suddenly, you know, force you to, to, do, to do with only one thing or another, or, you know, yeah, there might be different situations, but there aren't that many enemy types, you know, basically, 
you you fight these taken townsfolk and then crows, which also, you know, you, you shine a light on them and they disappear. And that's basically it. This is not a game you go to for a lot of variety in that regard. Now, the... I, yes, again, the, the, this light and, you know, using light to remove a shadow and then killing, in part, it's kind of like Remedy played the first obscure game and were like, we're going to make this work in a game. The, and, and they succeeded, because in, in obscure, they make the mistake that you can either shine the light or you can fire the gun. And it's really difficult to tell if you've shined the light for long enough because in that game it also says you have to remove the darkness from them before you can kill. In this game, not only can you do both at the same time, but it's extremely clear. Like, there's a bright flash around an enemy when the shadow disappears. And also just looking at them, either there's this dark... It's, it's kind of like Venom, actually. The, the, yeah, the Spider-Man character, not actual Venom. There's just shadowy little tentacle things just moving constantly off the, the Taken when they still have a shadow. And when they actually die, they don't leave a body, they kind of explode in light. It's, it, it reminds me of Blade, the, the Blade movies, when the, the vampires will explode into ash or sparks. And, yeah, it's, a, it's not something I've seen in a game before, and I, I like it a lot. It's, it's a different way of playing a third-person shooter. And that is something, this game, Remedy said that it, it has the mind of a psychological thriller and the body of a cinematic action game, and that's very much right. The, the enemies will, the, when you kill the last enemy, there'll be this slow motion death to signify that it's the last enemy. And it is very much, I mean, you, you can run, you can jump, there's this dodge function which I personally had trouble activating properly. It's on the same key as the run key. I wouldn't personally depend too much on it, but, you know, it it works okay, and I certainly don't really have a problem with them putting it on the run key. I have much more of a problem with them putting jump and climb on the same key, because sometimes the thing you're climbing is like a wooden log going across a river, and jumping instead of climbing might mean you go into the river, and that's just that's really annoying. It didn't happen a lot, but I was like constantly worried about it, and there's really no reason for that. They could have just put put it on the use key or something, like you know Max Payne three for example, which to be fair doesn't really have a jump key. But yeah, and in addition to that, the camera will pull out and fly to an enemy when you when you reach an area that has an enemy and then, you know, fly back to you. And there's also this key called the focus key, which, when prompted to do so, you can hold it down and the camera will pull out from Alan and show you something of interest. I, I do quite like that the camera always pulls out like that. There's a, the, the perspective is always with Alan. You never really... You never see something from a different character's perspective. We never really leave Alan's side. And it it can add to the sort of lonely feeling, to the, the, the isolated feeling of a lot of the game. And the... I suppose I should also mention that with this... At, at points, it, it almost feels like it's too action-driven, and certainly, you, you almost hesitate to call this a horror game at points, 
because it is so much more action driven than you know I've already mentioned Silent Hill you know classic Silent Hill is is very much survival horror the the action is not very it's not very actiony you might almost say that shooting can be a pain in a lot of survival horror now it is of course in a way a good thing that here the you know your weapons are quite dependable and you can actually focus aim you can properly shoot but yeah it, it is not the scariest game it's it's suspenseful and it's tense you know psychological thriller it's not the scariest and in ways they maybe didn't even go for that the the scares and atmosphere tend to be more subtle here than in a lot of survival horror again to to compare to Silent Hill in that you know the other world of Silent Hill is very in your face very openly gruesome of a place it you the moment you enter the other world you want to find a way out and here it's a bit more I, I should say I, I do I love Silent Hill I'm not I'm not trying to make negative comparisons to that game, but here it's and and again the the other world is also very long abandoned. It's it's in disrepair. It's an ugly, noisy place. Here, when it's when it's scary in this game, it's because you're in the forest at night. And it is basically just a small town, um, Americana, at night. It's, it's just barely abandoned. Like, you, you're at this logging mill, and it's like the machines are still there, and a lot of logs, and it feels like, well, everyone left a few hours ago. It doesn't feel like it was abandoned years ago. It's just this, this subtle and universal fear of something that's just been abandoned, where it's, 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 it's very close to being, you know, it's, everyone remembers when they were a kid and they were like, you know, outside of a store after closing time, or out in nature when it got dark. And it's not because you're necessarily at this place that's, you know, old and abandoned and falling apart, but it, it is just this, yeah, recently abandoned thing. And at the logging mill, they have these, you know, big piles of logs, and you're terrified that you know, they'll suddenly start rolling down to crush you, or even worse, signal the opening of Final Destination 2. And really, in general, the, the areas of the game, just, it's all this small town, and every, anytime it's scary, it is, you're almost always in the forest when it's scary, but it's varied enough, and, you know, you might be going near this big raging river, there are cliffs and rocks, maybe you're deeper in the forest and, you know, there's a lot of trees, and it's, it's, it's in part also because nature, the, the sheer force of nature is so close by, there are also, there, there are tornadoes and, you know, yeah, natural disaster is not necessarily far away. And, yeah, it's, it's because of man living so much at the, you know, at nature's mercy. It's, that's also just, that's scary. In, again, in this nice, subtle way. Now, there are exceptions to this more subtle scares. I, I should say, I, actually, to finish off the... I've already sort of mentioned about the, the atmosphere. 
it's just it's very expertly built and maintained throughout the game and there's this there's a real organic feel to it and it can go from serene to threatening in just a matter of seconds and because yeah you know during the day these small towns quaint you know you, good vacation spots and yeah so 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 yeah with to go for these less The, the, the less subtle scares. I should maybe say that it's... I'm not really much for supernatural horror, especially possession horror. I played this because of Remedy and the Steam Sale. It's, you know, Remedy, other than the Death Rally remake, have not let me down so far. I really, really like Max Payne 1 and 2, and this, so I acknowledge that I am not in, I'm not completely in the intended, yeah, our audience for this, and with that admitted, the Taken will sometimes give these taunts and basically it's these basic it's these basic normal things that these people might say and they do it in a possessed voice so the pitch will shift dramatically while they say the line from really low to really high and yeah, this is intended to be creepy, but I found it everything but. I thought it was very, very silly. And I, sh I should give examples. Basically, like I said, it's it's different areas of this. You know, maybe you go to the logging mill, you meet some, some of these taken. They might say, logging is a dangerous profession. Or, you know, be careful of these machines. You know, things like that. Or maybe you're near the this this camping ground and they talk about you know on, and they're they're like hunters in in the middle of the forest and they'll be talking about you know hunter stuff so yeah and another thing i found silly is when the straight up poltergeists hit at times these can be quite scary but basically things you know, normal objects, like a, you know, a, a rock might be lifted by this shadowy force and thrown at you. And once it lands, you know, it'll lift and throw itself at you. And each time you have a few seconds to shine the light at it and maybe try to dodge or, you know, something. And you don't need to shoot it, but the, the light will take care of it. And yeah, some of these can be quite scary, but it's also just something that if you don't, you know, go in for this kind of... I'm, I'm not trying to insult, you know, to each his own. It's just not my style of horror. If you don't completely go for this sort of possession horror, then that's where the game might at times seem silly to you. Now, the... The, the story and themes are very clearly inspired by Stephen King. There are some very clear references as well, but it's, it's this stuff of, you know, the nature of storytelling and, yeah, our protagonist is a writer and he's having trouble with writing and he comments on writing. It reminded me a lot of Secret Window, the, the movie. You know, better than that, but yeah. And it's... Yeah, and, and, and the setting, of course. And there's also some Twin Peaks in there, but I'm not gonna comment too much on that because I haven't watched the show. I know I will get to it. I definitely. Now, it is a... It's, it's a 
good idea of this having this New Yorker lost in this sleepy town, these this this dangerous nature, and th yeah, him trying to survive this you know nature stuff, and and there's also definite like other horror games, you can definitely feel Alan is not like a soldier. He's a regular person. He's not really used to this stuff and, you know, he's not necessarily in, you know, it's, it's somewhat limited what he can do. Now, the, the game is very much story driven. The, and it's, it's quite linear as well. It was supposed to be like sandbox, but then, you know, they, they eventually admitted that they couldn't really do the thriller pacing they wanted to in sandbox, and I can definitely see that. I do hope that Remedy at some point do make a sandbox with this light versus darkness thing. I'm not sure it should be part of the Alan Wake franchise, but, you know, maybe pull a Kane and Lynch with you know, the first Kane Lynch game is basically a spiritual successor to the, crap, what's it called? Freedom Fighters. And the two actually have nothing in common story-wise, but there's, you know, they, they took features from you know, Freedom Fighters, and put them in the first King Lynch. I hope Remedy do the same with this light and darkness thing, and just go for this different kind, because you can really see how, I mean, making your way from one area of this open world to another area, and you know in this other area there are maybe, you know, these 500 watt, you know, work lights, you, you know, you just gotta get a generator going. Or maybe you're here, and you've got lights, and then the generator dies. And you have to fight your way here to get the generator going. Or this place where maybe there are various survivors, and not all of them can fight. They have to be kept safe, so you have to go out and get... There's a lot of, of, of potential there, and I really hope they do that. But it would not work for Alan Wake. This this moves at a breakneck pace and you can't really do that in this in an open world you it, it requires a certain level of control for the you know and and in this it's it's linear you're in the hands of the of the programmers and thankfully those hands are very capable and yes if if you can't if, if you just do not like linear games, if you just will not put up with that, then again, this is not a game for you. I've, th uh, a number of reviews online are negative because of that, and I completely understand that. It's not a game for those who just will not have linear games. Now, and, and yeah, there's, there are no role-playing game elements as, you know, as there typically is in these newer games. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's very much... It's, it's quite like the first two Max Paynes, actually. And in fact, you might say that the Remedy are keen on making these dark, atmospheric stories titled after their main characters with these main characters' names being painful puns. And if you don't believe me, just try to reduce Alan's first name to its first letter and then reading that first letter and his last name aloud. Yeah. G given that this whole thing really makes you question, you know, is this real, is this fiction? Which again is, you know, Stephen King kind of, you know, this supernatural thing, and is this real or not? Now, the, the game very much is, you know, you move from point A to point B, you fight, 
you maybe solve a simple puzzle. The game itself, I think, just refers to them as mini games. I agree, they're mini games. They're not really puzzles. It's basically you're asked to rapidly click the left mouse button or click it at certain times, like with starting the generator. And that's basically it. And that's, you know, yeah, that's that's what the game, what they wanted to do. And I find that the story and atmosphere are so strong that you can overlook that. The writing can be a bit hit and miss, but I will say something that is these days far too rare with a good mystery. This does answer pretty much every question it brings up. I, you know, early on you have no idea what's going on in the game, but as you progress, you know, it becomes more clear. And by the end, there really isn't very much left that you don't understand. And at the same time, it doesn't take the fun away from the mystery. And, you know, it's, it's both a good ride, and once you reach the end, it's, it's fun to, you know, yeah, when you, when you reach the answers, those are satisfying as well. And I would say that it's, it's one of the good twist stories where even, you know, hearing the story over again, you, you know, you, you, you can see, I mean, I, I, like when I, they definitely leave clues, like, you can, you can put, you can piece some of the, piece, some of the things together in this mystery. And when you go over the mystery again, nothing is really just abandoned or forgotten. Everything pays off. And playing it again, you will notice these hints and, you know, little things that maybe the first time you didn't really notice or pay attention to. But once you know what they lead to, it's actually a fun little hint that, you know, you, yeah. It actually, just the, the very start of the game introduces a lot that you might not really think twice about. And then as you go through the rest of the game, it pays off. Now, the... Through the game, you will find these manuscript pages, and they're all from this book that Alan was going to write called Departure. And, yeah, it's, it's very strange that these are turning up without him having written it. So, that's, of course, something, something interesting, and what makes it all the stranger is that these, the things that the pages say seem to be coming true. Now, again, some reviewers have, have called this that the, the, these pages provide spoilers for the game. That's, there's this mistaken idea that if you know something that's going to happen later in a story, that's necessarily a spoiler, and that a story should only surprise you. A good story will sort of set up things before they happen, will maybe lead you to think, oh, is this going to happen? That's how you build suspense, is making people aware of what will happen or might happen. And every time you read one of these pages, and it's something that you then later see, you're... It, it again, it rushes you ahead, it makes you think what happens after the events written on this page? Oh, I gotta, I gotta just play a little bit more so I can get to the place that this page is talking about. I want to see what happens here. And in addition, it does also explain what other characters are doing. So again, the focus can remain on Alan. And this is fairly common that, you know, a survival horror will focus purely on 
a you know on our protagonist and basically the the script pages as a as a storytelling device they kind of take over for finding newspaper clippings and the like and not only had that cliche gotten pretty tired this is as I've already partially explained, a much more interesting... It's, it's tied directly to the nature of Alan, you know... It's, it's not just stumbling onto... It's, it's a personal story. He's not stumbling onto something completely different, or at least it's in part a personal story also, because it seems to be his writing. And this is, you know, he, he recognizes his own style of writing. And th this also, this, this is, instead of also the, the comic book panels of Max Payne 1 and 2. And basically, the, they are, you know, you see the page and the voice of Alan narrates the page, re reads the page aloud. And like a storyteller, not like Alan. You know, he doesn't read it and is then surprised by what it says. And, you know, that, that's, yeah, that, that's basically it. And that's how a lot of the story is told. And, yeah, it's just, it's very effective. It's, I've, I've already mentioned how the, the game evokes the feeling of a movie and TV show, it also evokes the feeling of a good book. You might actually pick up a good novel after playing the game, and yeah, so it, so it combines all these different takes on storytelling, and it's, it's very effective in that. Now, the... Yes, in addition to it being like an action, you know, the body of an action game, it actually, it has defend the area and escort type scenarios. So, yeah, again, not something you typically see in survival horror. Now, the... The, the camera is a tad awkward, but I found it to be fine. It, it clearly bothered some people a lot, and it certainly is. It's not your average third-person camera. The camera is in your control. It, you, know, you can turn it 360 degrees, and at first I worried that this might take away from the terror. It's, you know, a lot of survival horror, you can't look behind you without actually turning around. But not so. It's it's very helpful in the action and indeed if you don't you know, if you don't look around, you will actually you know yeah, you, you have to be very careful because they will try to surround you. And you know, and, and they'll be armed with, like, axes, they might have pickaxes or knives that they'll throw at you. You know, on, only, like, one or two each or something, but, you know, it'll, it'll stun lock you a little bit, and, yeah, you, you gotta be careful. And uh, getting surrounded is not something you want. Especially, you know, getting surrounded and having them close to you is not something you want uh, to have happen. Now, the... I, sh I should perhaps talk a little bit more about the guns you have. You typically have a revolver, and, and this is of course quite effective in that you can put just one bullet in it when you reload, and that might be enough. Excuse me, but if you want... Excuse me, if you wanted to reload all the way, Alan's gonna have to excuse me, manually put all six bullets in. And so, and that's again where the tapping the reload key comes in. And then you have shotguns, which again, loaded one by one, and this hunting rifle. You can only carry one rifle at a time. And there are two different shotguns, one with only, 
you know, a, a regular two barrel one and then a pump action. And the hunting rifle is more powerful but also slower than the shotguns. And the shotguns is again, you know, you can push back enemies with it. Now To go with the, the pacing, the, the plot keeps moving, the characters, you know, new characters are introduced, the, the characters are fleshed out and, you know, developed, it, it really keeps it moving. And something that's quite clever is that every episode will literally start with a recap and then you're in, you know, very television show style. and it, it you know, brings focus to this that you've seen before is now going to be important again. So very effective like that. And then you're walking around during the day and as you, you know, yeah, as, as you move around this little town, you meet the friendly people, there, there's Rose, this really bubbly, you know, waitress at the local diner and she's like a huge fan of Alan. She brought the, like, the, this is not a spoiler, it's the first thing you do in the game is walk into her diner, or a diner where she's a waitress, and she starts fawning over you and she indicates there's this cardboard cutout of you, of Alan, that she, she got from the bookstore once they, you know, stopped displaying his book there, and she brought it to the, the, the cafeteria, and it, yeah, it, there's, there's this small town doctor who's like this elderly guy, and he goes fishing in the weed, like, yeah, it's, just, there's this local radio host, you know, who is like very friendly, and he, he recognizes you, and then, you know, Alan asks, please keep this a secret, I'm trying to be on vacation, I'm trying to be incognito, and, you know, he's, yeah, nice and friendly guy, and you're moving around these areas, and that's where the serene atmosphere comes in, it looks like a really nice place, you want to go vacationing there yourself, you know, and then the story takes you to the night time, and then it really starts getting sinister and yeah and these same areas that looked so friendly and serene are now just terrifying to you and you might even meet some of the people that you met during the day during the night and that won't be pleasant so there's there's that too and, and as you get further through the, the episodes, you know, the, the later episodes, it will get increasingly strange and eerie even during the day. So it's, it's like giving a small, you know, again, safe haven, you know, a little bit of light in all this darkness of Alan's existence in Bright Falls and then taking it away. And even when you're in the light, it's... It, it gets more and more unpleasant. It's, there's clearly something wrong, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really great like that. Now, the... And, and as you go, you also meet, you know, you, you see more of these different areas, and it all feels like it belongs in Bright Falls. Another character I have to mention is, you're not the only New Yorker in the, the story. There's also, and you and Alice, Barry, the, the agent of Alan, who is like this big, kind of annoying guy. It's just, yeah, he's, he's a lot of fun. He's like, one of the first things he does once he's introduced is threaten to sick his lawyers on someone and he's just, yeah, 
big city guy very much, so, you know. I should also, a few more details about Alan himself. He's kind of, he's, he's tense because of the writer's block, and he, he can be kind of a jerk at times. And, but, but at the end, he's, he is also, he is a likable protagonist. He's, he's a flawed but likable protagonist. Now, the, the graphics are amazing. That is another area. The, the story and the graphics are the real strengths of this game. And, and the core concept of the gameplay, I would say. This might be the most realistic water I've ever seen in a game, which is good, because there's a lot of it. There, you know, there are these rivers and such. Reflection is very natural. Fog is compelling. And, and of course, the light and the, the shadow is just incredible looking. There, there are a lot of lens flares and a lot of lighting effects. You know, given the, the basic concept with this, you know, using light to fight darkness, that is to be expected. And again, if that, if what I've described of the gameplay doesn't grab you, that again, well, that should almost be obvious, then not a game for you. Now, it's, it's a very authentic experience, the, the world feels very real, in part because of this product placement, which is very much intentional, from real companies, including Verizon, but I don't know, if, if you're gonna go with such blatant product placement, I feel like they should have gone with Sprint. Now, the there, there is very little violence, and I'm not sh there's barely any gore at all. There's a little bit of blood, but it'll typically be on, like, if you find a corpse or something, or find someone dying. But it's really very rare, and again, when you kill these Taken, they just disappear in light. There's no blood, there's no... You know, so yeah, there, and and that again is is interesting and and makes it feel less like survival horror and more like psychological thriller. Now the the narration is very effective, and there's it's not just for the script pages; it's also just in general. Alan thinks to himself a lot, like Max Payne does, and and it's it's again that. It's clear Remedy loves this genre. This is a huge tribute. Max Payne... Th this game is to the Stephen King small town psychological thriller slash maybe horror what Max Payne was to, you know, noir and comic book panel storytelling and John Woo action. So, yeah, it's it's clear that they love this stuff and really wanted to do it justice. And I would say they have, but I am admittedly not that much of an expert on Stephen King. Now, and and for what it's worth, I will admit I'm not that much of a fan of Stephen King either. He's there are a few of his stories that I like, but yeah. And now the the. The, the, these, this narration and the dialogue tends to be rather well written. Where I found it to be less well written and kind of repetitive is when it restates objectives. And it's especially annoying because these monologues and dialogues that restate objectives sometimes go in over other dialogue. like. It, it happens as it typically does in these games. This was also something I mentioned in my Max Payne 3 review, and I believe my Max Payne 2 review was certainly a problem back in Max Payne 2 as well. It happens as you're just exploring, as you're looking for more ammo, or trying to make sure you got, you know, everything that was interesting in this area. I personally find that this is something that should be able to be turned off, and as far as I've been able to tell, these games have not allowed that. Or, 
that like it offers it like at the bottom of the screen it says you know press this button for a hint and then if you press the button then you get this you know restating of, of objectives or hint or such but in this game it's especially annoying because it will literally go over some, like because of the subtitles I s could still follow what the different ones said but it's still kind of annoying now the 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 game is quite actually before I get into that the over the course of the well-designed levels, you will have to go through these old buildings. And again, the, they're not necessarily long abandoned, although some are. You know, some, some are ones that should probably have been torn down, but maybe the town didn't really have the money to do that, you know, something like that. And also across these rickety bridges with just this raging river and cliffs below, and you're like constantly worried that they're gonna collapse under your feet and send you, you know, plummeting down to your death. So that's very effective. And it's something they use quite a bit, but at the same time, they mix it up enough that it's never boring. I loved the parts of this game where you're worrying about falling down to your death. The, and there are these, you know, abandoned machines, like, for example, with the lumber mill, you have these big, you know, clearly man-made, and clearly, if you saw them in the daylight, they wouldn't be scary, but they just look so ominous, you know. And the, the music is also quite effective, very unsettling, and always fits the mood, also during the serene moments. Now, the, the game is quite immersive, and this is in part, you know, some, some of what takes it away is some of what also gives it the replayability that it does have, which is admittedly not a huge amount. There are, you know, other, other than the three difficulty settings, and you have to beat it once to unlock the, the hardest difficulty setting. And by the way, this is a fairly challenging game. This is more challenging than a lot of current games, so just keep that in mind when... Tr and, and you can't readjust, as far as I've been able to tell, the difficulty setting once you start the game, so just keep that in mind. Although, if you play a certain amount and, you know, then go back and replay, you can, like, jump it doesn't have for every single checkpoint, which is understandable, because there are a ton, but, you know, you can at least choose, do you want to replay the day part, or do you want to jump straight to the night part? Now, the, yeah, the, the other things, there are collectibles and achievements, and I find that achievements are more okay, but I wish it would let you turn off the the notification, which, again, at least I haven't noticed if there is a place to do that. I don't think it's in the game itself, at least. Maybe it's in Steam, and I need to just look closer, but yeah, that's a little... And the, the collectibles, that's something that is in a lot of survival horror that, again, you know, pretty common in Silent Hill, but here there's, like, a statistics screen, you know, you can go in the menu and actually look at how far you are in that, whereas in Silent Hill you're just told at the very end. I I realize you could just ignore it, you, you don't have to check the statistics, but I just, I do prefer that it's not that, it's, it's maybe especially because there are things that are very clearly just for that, there are just collectibles, and, you know, in, in Silent Hill, it'll also just say, you know, you found this and this much of the stuff you were, gonna, you were looking for anyway, like ammo and guns. And I find that that's more satisfying. Then once you've played it once, you see the statistics, you know, if you want to play it again just to get the last things, then, you know, you maybe do that. Or 
tells you, you know, you could have had even more ammo, so, you know, stuff like that. And another thing is that you basically have this mini-map or a radar. Now, this is apparently supposed to be Alan's GPS on, on his cell phone. I accept that as the explanation, but I don't think that that horror or even thriller that it's it's at the very least a supernatural thriller and I don't think that it should have a a mini map like that it just feels like you know there there's a map in like shattered memories but that's very much a that's fairly minimal when you're just looking at it, and you have to bring it up to properly see it. This one doesn't give you a map, but you have this radar thing where it'll show you what basic direction you're going in. I wish they had just let the light be your guide, and it's in part supposed to be, but like a game like Left 4 Dead, you know, both of them, have light as the only guide, and in those games, yeah, players can find their way, and yeah, I wish they had done that in this as well. It's It takes you out of the helplessness of the powerless situation you're in when you can look at the top left corner and see this radar thing, you know. It, yeah. And the... It's also one of the more noticeable parts of the HUD, which, again, I find that the more you hide the HUD in a horror game, or at least a thriller game, supernatural thriller, the, again, the more effective it'll be. And other than this, you know, thing, you'll only have a count of how much ammo you have left, how, you know, the battery level and how many batteries you have left, and then you know, how many you have left of either flare or flashbang, whichever you've chosen. And those, I don't think, are that distracting. That seems like, you know, you could basically memorize things like that, you know. Uh, you know. So, yeah. Now, the game does have, much like, you know, Max Payne, these, these TVs, with this very corny Twilight Zone, you know, ish show that called Night Springs, and there's apparently also an Xbox game, so that's cool. And yeah, they they like the the TV shows in Max Payne one and two. They will kind of comment on the current situation and you know further themes and such. And then there's also these radios, which typically get you to hear, l listen to Pat Main, the aforementioned, but here's before, you know, until now, I hadn't named him, the, the radio, you know, host of the local radio station. And, yeah, it, it kind of gives an idea of what's going on. It, it, it goes for both atmosphere and, you know, the exposition, storytelling, and such. Now, the... There's a very high level of detail, and there are these things that you might not even really notice. Like, early on, you might scare off some crows, and, like, there's a group of them that you will scare off, but then there are a lot that just sitting around, sitting very still. And yeah, and yeah, this definitely has some, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, the birds kind of thing going on. And if you, you know, if you go exploring, you might scare off these, you know, other crows that are sitting still, very still, one by one. But if you don't, they, they'll just be there. So that's, it's a good kind of, you know, depending on how much you delve into the the game and the world and explore, you might see more and might give you more experiences. So, you know, it doesn't take complete charge of you in, in the game. Now, I suppose that pretty
pretty much covers it. So, yeah, if... I, I hope they make more, and I really hope that they do a sandbox of this at some point. And, and at times you could definitely tell that it was supposed to be a sandbox. There, you know... Oh, actually, that brings me to the car. You can drive at certain points in this. And that also very much makes you wonder if you weren't supposed to be able to drive much, you know, somewhat more freely. And it's... It feels somewhat like Grand Theft Auto when driving. It's like not perfect handling and you know you can't if you if you accelerate if you're driving fairly fast you won't necessarily be able to stop the car immediately and basically the high beams will act as the flashlight so you use that to knock off the the shadow from the taken and then you run them over to kill them and you'll want to be careful because if you get surrounded or, you know, if they attack the car a bunch, it won't, like, explode or something, but it will eventually become, or eventually, they can destroy it to the point where you can't drive it anymore, and then you'll be stepping out of the car, and there you go, now you're, you know, now they're close to you and you're not in a car anymore. Actually, I should mention as well that the... The, the Taken can run some of them extremely fast, some like the mini-bosses will just zip right past. And the, the acting is great, with a few exceptions. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.